first on Guam. KUAM News Headlines are presented by Calvo's Insurance, protecting Micronesia for 85 years. Matson and the Adahi Idano program. Apply at matson.com. Cars Plus, Guam's automotive leader in sustainability and electric vehicles. Learn more at carsplusguam.com. McDonald's of Guam, I'm loving it. And King's Restaurant, serving your local breakfast, lunch, and dinner favorites for over 45 years. Ahead on KUAM News Primetime. A solemn ceremony honoring the island's fallen heroes is held. Jason Salas has the story coming up. Plus, the superintendent of the Guam Department of Education gives an update on plans to right-size its schools. And a bill that would help bring parity for pay amongst all airport employees to include airport police and ARF is heard. Jonah Gancharferis has more. Half a day and good evening. Welcome to KUAM News Primetime. I'm Destiny Cruz. And I'm Mitsuki Hariyama. So glad you could join us. Well, after the completion of initial evaluations of the Guam Department of Education schools for right sizing, the recommendations are in for GDOE superintendent. But Dr. Kenneth Swanson says it's not available for public view just yet, as he weighs out several considerations on how to proceed. Swanson getting back 8,000 parent responses from survey input and a total of 16,000 plus survey feedback from parents, students and staff, which has yet to be folded into the process. I expect to provide a preliminary, as I show here, the preliminary proposals to the board in uh, July or August. And then at that time, that information will be made public. But it's still in, it's still in, uh, it's still in labor. It's not ready for delivery yet. Meanwhile, the superintendent says those discussions will continue. He adds movement forward involves potentially reprogramming funding to do work on schools, which would solve other problems in the process. Meantime, the Guam Education Board has opted not to make any major decisions before January 2026. Well, in other news, it's a bill that, if passed, would allow officers and guards with the airport police and the aircraft rescue and firefighting unit to be included in the Guam International Airport Authority Aviation-related and certified technical and professional compensation plan. Such a move would bring parity for pay amongst all the airport employees. Jonigan Charfers has more from Friday's public hearing. Despite efforts by the Guam International Airport Authority Board to study and adjust compensation for all certified, technical, and professional positions, including airport police and the Aircraft Rescue and Firefighting Division, inconsistencies have arisen due to the influence of the Law Enforcement Officer Pay Plan. During a public hearing held Friday, a handful from the airport spoke in favor of the bill. Introduced by Senator Jesse Lujan, Bill 275 would integrate the airport police and ARF who play a vital role. Who work tirelessly around the clock to ensure the safety and security of the traveling public and the thousands of individuals passing through the airport every day. GIAA Executive Manager John Kanata explains that a study was conducted and presented in July 2023 to GIAA Board of Directors. The GIAA Board approved updating the pay scales from 2012 market data to the 20th percentile to 2022 market data at the same 20th percentile for all GIA employees to include airport police and, of course, ARF positions. This was to go into effect on the last pay period of January 2024, but because both divisions are still under the LEO plan pay scale, implementation is at a standstill. With Bill 275, it will allow the airport to fully implement the study recommendation. Kanata noting that after the horrific events of September 11, 2001, it changed the travel landscape forever with the Transportation Security Act, which mandated airports to meet even more security and law enforcement measures. Before Vince Napati, chief of airport police, provided testimony, he presented a copy of the bill along with 52 pages full of signatures from airport police personnel, airport employees and tenants, family and friends, and those from the local and federal law enforcement community, all in support of the bill. Police officers, including security guards, are not only guided by the Guam Code annotated and federal law, 
but also for enforcing the airport security program in accordance with our federal mandates. To adhere to these regulatory compliances, the airport police has specialized units, such as the K-9 Explosives Unit and the Special Enforcement and Tactics Team, also known as SET. SETS is dedicated to enhancing security measures, conducting intelligence operations, and various threats such as terrorism, both foreign and domestic. The team is specifically focused on addressing incidents involving weapons of mass destruction, hijackings, hostage rescue, bus and aircraft assaults, and violent crimes occurring at the Guam International Airport. With crime appearing to be on the rise, Senator Joanne Brown commented on how she feels the streets aren't safe. We're doing our part. We're actually the second call for service, other than GPD, that they, uh, they call us uh, in time of need and response. And we, we yield to the call, and we go, and we help out our, our counterparts. Napati sharing the same sentiment as a senator. That we're looking at how do we make this safe. Well, Post Commission did that. We need to be better. Um, that's what training is for. That's what the standards was for is to make sure and ensure that each officer that's out there is equipped, is trained properly, and we could do our job effectively. However, he says to improve retention rates, transitioning officers and guards into the CTP plan will enable them to offer competitive salaries to retain highly skilled personnel. Jonagan Charfris, KM News. An annual tradition was held ahead of Memorial Day, one that carries significant meaning to our community. Jason Salas has more from Barragada on the Fallen Heroes Ceremony. For those that took the oath to serve, taking up arms, honorably doing your duty, and standing fast until your skills were put to use and then made the ultimate sacrifice, we will always remember and will always be grateful. To the families of our fallen, Please know that your loved ones will forever be remembered as heroes. Their service and sacrifice will never be forgotten, and their spirit will continue to guide and inspire us. The annual Fallen Heroes Ceremony was held in Barragada at the Guam National Guard Readiness Complex, reflecting on the loss of six local guardsmen killed in action, whose names are cherished now and for all time. Our obligation is to give voice to the fallen to honor them and to share their stories of sacrifice and heroism. Our opportunity is to use this day to inspire new generations to understand the freedom that they've been given, to grasp how and why it is theirs. The families left behind by those that gave their lives to secure our freedom continue to honor their loved ones. Let us ensure that their sacrifices were not in vain by committing ourselves to upholding the values they held dear and by striving to create a world where peace and freedom prevail. And their fellow soldiers and airmen remain focused on honoring their legacy. We, the soldiers and airmen of the Guam National Guard, lack the words to describe the emotions you feel for the loss of your loved ones. But we do know what your sacrifice means to us, to our island, to our nation, and to a world that still depends so much on Guam's men and women in uniform. So every day, but especially on this Memorial Day weekend, we send our support, our respect, and our love. See Julius Masi, and thank you. Thank you all for your service. We'll be right back. Keep it here, you're watching KUAM. This racetrack has made it possible to make Guam, as mentioned, a center of the world. Racers from the States, racers from Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and so on, brings everything together, brings us all together in this part of the world. And that is wonderful in itself.
Pat Not Howie says Taco Bell only really hits after midnight, which is why I'm gonna use the Cantina chicken menu to help him see the Taco Bell light. Mm, very juicy. <laughs> Hi. The uh, food hits, right? Are you at Not Howie? Does it hit or does it not hit? I'd say it hits. Yeah, it does hit. I can't lie. Okay, but you did, maybe. The Cantina Chicken Crispy Taco isn't just for late night. Solid. Solid. Solid! That early hour of the morning. Mm. Solid. Solid. Oh, yeah. Solid. Welcome back to Primetime. A familiar face was back in town continuing to work with and for the local community as she's always done. Well, we've known Athena McNinch for several years and she's using her island upbringing to make a big difference in the federal government. Hafenay, everybody. KUM is the place to be if wonderful people from our island uh, for whatever reason, leave and they go to the mainland, go elsewhere in the world and doing amazing things. And back on Guam's soil, where she belongs for at least a week because she's doing very wonderful work with the federal government, Athena thank, McNinch. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody knows Athena because she, you know, she competed in beauty pageants. She's a wonderful ambassador for our island. She did work with like tourism. Uh, such a wonderful spirit to have, you know, Aww, representing our people. You. And now you're actually taking that same approach, Athena, to work in the federal government and you're doing very, very important work at labor. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely a transition, you know, like coming from Guam and then just going to the States and doing my own thing. There's definitely, it's different, but always keeping home in the back of my mind as mm -hmm. well as something that's always been there. And your home base right now in the San Francisco Bay Area. Yes. So, you know what they say, like the... The coldest winter I ever spent is the summer I spent in San Francisco. I mean, you're not wrong there, for sure. <laughs> How does an island girl go from, like, our humidity, our, you know, mm -hmm. laid-back vibe, our beach? And the beaches there are, like, nice, too, but they're just way colder. Oh, yeah, definitely. I actually was in San Diego, and then I moved up to San Francisco. So I feel like I'm exploring different cities within California. Very nice. And just you know, adapting to each city. Mm -hmm. But so far, I've been really loving San Francisco. It's been growing on me. Okay, sure. and we worked with you for years. Um, you know, we've always been impressed with your drive, with your ambition, and with your work oh, ethic. Thank you. Um, but what made you choose labor? Or do you believe that, like, the career chose you, or was it an opportunity that you saw that you could contribute? You know, I was, I remember, you know, I was living in San Diego at the time. I was trying to think about, you know, other opportunities that were available. So I was just applying at different jobs. And I remember seeing this agency, EBSA, the Employee Benefits Security Administration, pop up. And I read the description. I thought, you know, I think this would be a great fit. And so I applied. Um, I got the interview. And then I remember doing the interview on a Friday. And then on a Monday, I got that email saying, congratulations. Nice. We want you. And I remember being so excited. And I was like, okay, I'm definitely, I'm moving up right now. Well, um, I don't know if I was on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> as a reference, but I can vouch for you that you're a wonderful interview. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I yeah, know. I remember when that all happened, it was just crazy. Um, but it all worked out, and I, I love my office. I love my team. I have a great supervisor, a great regional director. Mm. Um, definitely just great. I'm surrounded by great people. Mm. And I remember the last time, I believe, when we had you here. We'll try and pop up a picture of that. But when we had oh. you here, you know, following your beauty pageant run, you know, with yeah. the, big, the big crown, the, t the sash and everything, which was a fantastic yeah. picture, I remember that. But you always said, you know, you've always believed that you fight for the little guy. And like you represent the people and you want to, you want yeah. to help people. That's, that's at your core. That kind of falls in line with what you're doing now. Yeah, it does. It's definitely interesting to see, you know, me as a person and then what I do for a living. And so I'm constantly talking to people who are in need and who need help. And, you know, they call us with issues like, for example, if they're noticing like $500 missing from their pay stub that was taken out to be put into their 401k. And they're like, this, you know, we're having this issue and so I'll take a look at their documents and I'll get in contact with the employer and go from there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely a good feeling, you know, helping others, especially those that feel like they don't have a voice mm -hmm. um, and being there for them. And so it's always just whenever I get, you know, something out of that or I figure out what's going on, um, it's definitely just an amazing feeling. <laughs> And 
And now for a look at your world at home. Here's a view captured near the Lupang Cove in Samaning. Last year, I learned that my baby Kaya had a serious medical condition. I needed to go off island for an emergency procedure. We needed a passport to get her to Manila. That would take weeks. I was devastated. I called the congressman's office. I want to thank the office of Congressman James Moylan because they were able to get Kaya's passport in a few days. Today, my baby is healthy and will be soon be celebrating another birthday. If you or your family need assistance with passports, please contact my office at 671-922-6673. Welcome to Kmart, your 24-hour superstore since 1995. Always there for you, day or night. At Kmart, we're committed to offering you an extensive selection of products at prices you won't find anywhere else. From the essential to the exceptional, our aisles are alive with possibility. Bloom with confidence, style, and savings this spring. Discover stylish clothing that fits your budget without compromising on quality. From trendy pieces to timeless classics, find the perfect look for every member of your family without spending a fortune. Then pamper yourself with our selection of essentials from nourishing shampoos to rejuvenating beauty products and soaps. Let imagination soar with our selection of toys and games for kids of all ages. At Kmart, experience the thrill of discovery as you explore our aisles, filled with a variety of quality products that cater to your every need. From groceries to home goods to outdoor essentials, we are the ultimate one-stop shop. Dive into an unparalleled shopping experience where quality, variety, and savings away at every turn. Shop smart, save big at Kmart, your 24-hour superstore. Don't need to work, but keep the smile on your face. The moments you can't replace, and I'll be right. Whether you call her Abuela, Nana, Yaya, Gramps, Gigi, Mimi, or Granny, 
Grandma knows a sweet treat makes any meal special. So come to McDonald's and treat yourself to the Grandma McFlurry today. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Guam is truly a majestic place with its sheer natural beauty, wealth of beaches, and culturally rich landscape. Unfortunately, Guam has a real problem with unwanted invasive species. Help us in preventing their introduction and spread. The coconut rhinoceros beetle, the little fire ant, the African snail, Siam weed. These are just a few of the numerous invasives on Guam. Follow proper custom procedures when bringing plants and animals into Guam. Help protect Guam. Tell your family and friends about invasive species. To report invasive species, call 475-PEST. That goes with your flow. Get unlimited local talk, text, and data at the most affordable rate with unlimited flow postpaid. Hot day, everybody. 2Ks and 5Ks are super awesome. This we know. You know how they get even better, if such thing is possible? When you involve your pets, and the Rotary Club of Guam is doing just that. So make sure to bring out your furry friends. June 1st at Chamorro Village, Showtime 515. The 5K walk run event starts at 6, and there's a 2K pet walk starting at 6.05. This is absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm super stoked for that. All right, June is Pride Month, and to kick off the festivities, a Wave for Pride 2024 is going to happen, and make sure that you go down and support it's at chief kapua loop downtown starting at 4 30 in the afternoon sunset meet time is 4 15 at the parking lot at the paseo speaking of pride month if you are up in saipan there is a proclamation signing for pride month that is going to happen on thursday may 30th at micro beach to celebrate pride we have the island weekend ahead of us that's what we do on news bites time now for birthday wishes Here's your Code Stone Creamery Birthday Club shoutouts, which you can submit on KUAM.com. Okay, everybody, it's Memorial Day today, Monday, the 27th of May. So happy birthday to Roy Marasigan. Happiest of belated birthdays to Kuya Roy. Thank you so much for all that you do and hope you had a absolutely great birthday. And we want to wish everybody out there. And that's your primetime show. Thanks for watching. I'm Destiny Cruz. And I'm Matsuki Hurayama. Have a safe evening and, and stay, stay beautiful. beautiful. I'm sure many of our viewers can probably pick up the audio that's coming around in our studio. The storm has arrived. Category 4 Typhoon Mawar may no longer be a super typhoon, but it is still a major cause for concern for everyone here in the territory. The storm making landfall late this afternoon. The eye of the storm predicted to hit the southern region, but it nudged it further north. We really started to see some of the worst conditions as early as 3 o'clock this afternoon. Shutters even being ripped off right off the building. Let's take a look at video captured this afternoon just outside our home and studios. One year after Typhoon Mawar battered Guam and the Marianas, Hafa Dam, Nick Delgado, welcome to a special anniversary of Typhoon Mawar hitting our island here, mightier than Mawar. It's all in the name Hafa Day to the KWM News team here as well for joining us and sharing your experience. It's been a long time since we were hit this hard and for some of you never experienced it before in a day in your life. What do you recall preparations were like for you? We'll start with you, Vic. 
Um, for me, you know, being here at KOM for all these years, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of uh, storms come through, a lot of storm watches, I participated in a lot of that. So this one was kind of uh, different because we knew that it was going to be um, something that's going to hit us hard. So the preparation was a little more uh, uh, crazier where you kind of stock up at home and, and preparing everything while you set up that and then come to work. So it was, it was, it was a little different from the other ones. Well, I guess as the uh, elder statesman now on our team, um, it, it was procedure for me because I've covered enough of these over the years. Um, and like, Joan and I have done a bunch together. And so I was basically camped out at civil defense and Homeland Security for like the three days leading up to it, doing live streams every day, yeah. getting updates from the NWS. And, and yeah, like Vic said, I mean, they were anticipating, I think the, the specific line that NWS gave us was they were like, we're projecting this being a long day uh, with significant destruction. Well, like Jay said, you know, we've experienced many uh, typhoons, and this was actually the first one where I, you know, waited out here at the station. So there was no one at our house, though, but we secured it before heading out to our respective jobs. So that was the part that was kind of, you know, scary. But yeah, sat here through what, 48 hours of the typhoon? Mm -hmm. So. Well, for personally for me, I felt like I was on the flip side to this because this was my first typhoon that I experienced as an, as an adult where I can remember what actually happened. But I definitely was not pre prepared for it. I remember Destiny was telling us she had like this uncanny feeling where I feel like once we come back from this, everything is going to be changed. And I didn't believe her until it happened and everything was different. Yeah. Yeah. And similar experience with Suki, um, as an adult, this is my first time really experiencing a typhoon of this magnitude. And something that really sticks out to me is uh, before the storm hit, we went out as a team to go and see how people were preparing, getting water, gassing up their cars. So did the same thing. And it was, it was definitely an experience and a lesson learned, definitely, at that. That we don't want to do again. Definitely not. But all, uh, we all covered the stories that happened in the days leading up to the storm making landfall and in the aftermath. And we have one of those stories to share with you right now. Definitely one of those things that we do not want to forget is that people were touched differently by Typhoon Mauer. And one of those, uh, two of those residents that we have to, we cannot forget is uh, Julie Gogui and Doris. And we check in with them a year after Typhoon Mauer. I don't know what else to do. Like, I can't tell her that we're gonna be okay. This was Dededo resident Julie Gogui in the aftermath of Typhoon Mawar last May, taking in the damage of the storm's wrath on the home she shares with her mother Doris. The strong winds ripping the roof off their house while rain flooded inside, leaving behind a devastating image of the haven her late father built before his passing. Mawar rendering the place unlivable. It's just hard. It's like, she's ever wondering who's going to rebuild her house because her husband I'm like, I don't know, we'll try. Now, a year later, Julie and her mother Doris sit in front of the pink and blue painted walls of their renovated home. Julie's younger brother and his co-workers did the rebuilding, but the journey to getting their home back together was a struggle. After not qualifying for some post mower services, like the Rise Up Temporary Roofing Project. I mean, I thought the point is to fix the roof. I mean, if you're, if I'm not all damaged up there, then they'll help. But if it's totally damaged, they can't help. I don't understand that. Their property even turning into an illegal dumping area after the storm. When we clear it, they dump again. The cars, we clear the cars, they come take it, then they put cars again. And yet, amid so much hardship, the duo's resilience is still unwavering. They leave this message with others on the anniversary of Mawar. For those people out there that are still, you know, struggling, I'm still struggling, I'm still up to now. People are still struggling out there, just have faith and just keep moving on, just do what you can do. You no, know, I just always say just have hope. And there's a will, yeah. there's a way. Days after Mawar, the community came together, cleaning up for each other. The effort took us to the place Delma Kaiko and her family called home. Five houses and seven family on the ranch. It was so hard in the beginning when we were cleaning. It was really hard for us to like rebuild it, to start all over. 
so hard because when we came here there was no houses like just one so we have to start again to buy stuffs to rebuild the house volunteers showing up was just the start we were able to clear their entire area in one day and then in the, the following day when we went back to get the trash, we were able to take out the majority of the trash too. So it was just like a really great showing for the community. Now, one year later, structures now stand with roofs over their growing families' heads. Cameron Roosevelt showed us where they are in their recovery. Uh, that one is the one that uh, Delma did, and this one is the one that my sister lost Ali did. Yeah. Talk about, you know, was it, was it, was it really like, uh, months after? Did it take a while to, to get funds? To yeah, it did, uh, it did take a while after, because uh, uh, that group, uh, group Nihi, the, yeah, I think that's what it's called. Uh, that group Nihi helped them out uh, with some uh, donations and with the help and also uh, their claims with FEMA. Still, getting back to the way things were before the storm is an ongoing process. It's been uh, progressing. So uh, after, uh, after like losing everything and then getting back like little by little, uh, they're, uh, they're actually back on their feet now. And then, and is it, are you guys at 100% or are you guys still? Not really 100% as you guys can see, this ranch is still uh, growing. Uh, they're still trying to build more into it. Like, it's not quite finished. They're still uh, doing little by little what they can. Uh, they're, uh, they're actually building it themselves. So, uh, when they have time, uh, besides their uh, usual jobs, they actually put, uh, put more on. Wow, a lot went down on the night of the storm, especially right here. Can you believe that this is where all of the water was coming down? It was like a waterfall, exactly where we are right here. I mean, no tickets to come, going to the pool at this one, right? No fares needed. It was a flood. Blood zone. Is that something you're familiar with working here as well, Jason? Well, year? okay. Well, the kind of like the inside story that nobody out there knows is I was actually going around to like everybody here, and especially those of you that this was your first storm. And I emphatically told you guys, guys, if you want to ride it out here, there's no place safer than to take care of, you know, take care of yourself and your family. Then at KUM, we've got good internet, we've got generators, we've got aircon. I came in the next day because it's just me and my mom, and this is the first storm, unlike Joan, that uh, I actually went home. Uh, to take care of. I came in like the next day and I could not believe just how much damage there was and I saw you guys like get up the next day. It was crazy. For me, I remember, well aside from like the flooding and all the water coming down, um, for me it was hearing the tin outside just like scraping against the, the parking lot mm -hmm. and also like the parts where the shutters weren't really covering. You could hear like the, the wind going through so it's like a howling and it was almost like not knowing what is going on outside and all you could do is just like sit in here and like wait it out and um but i'm so glad that i was here with you know with team kum too because i can't imagine me at home alone and going through all that and That's experiencing true. all that we we're literally holding down the fort but i think <laughs> those words that you provided for us chase did provide some comfort because we did have that confidence that things were going to hold together even though when mitsuki and i were anchoring that night you could hear the entire newscast, just the rumble and the storm was here. And there's a word together, at least yeah. everybody, everybody here, you guys all had each other. Huh. Right, yeah, I definitely remember. I was um, sleeping right here where we are actually <laughs> on this couch, <laughs> trying to take a nap with all the sounds around us. But I remember like water was falling down from our ceilings. It was coming down the walls and we were getting worried about the equipment. Thankfully, our, most of the equipment was fine, but I remember um, something even fell on top of our cameraman Daniel's um, head, but oh, thankfully no. he was not injured, but it was just a, a scary experience overall. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I was at home, thankfully, uh, during the storm, and it's something uh, I resonate with with Joan about not knowing what was going on outside, but, you know, I'm a very uh, audio 
learner, I guess I'm an audio individual. So hearing all of that going on outside was so terrifying in all honesty. Uh, my dogs actually like, went into the closet because they were so fearful of what mm -hmm. was going on outside. So that was one thing that really stood out to me, definitely. And then that story we just saw with you, Victorious, when you had to revisit Zero Down, incredible, incredible what we just saw the images coming out of there in the aftermath. And great to see how they recovered, but the recovery isn't done yet. No, not yet. And like we heard from, you know, we wanted to talk to that, uh, the individual that we talked to when we went there, but obviously she was off island with the dad and we're doing an um, appointment in Hawaii. But just talking to the cousin and just seeing, um, her, her telling us the, the process that they had to go through, you know, they had SBA here, they had FEMA, and the, the process that they, they had to go through to get those loans and get those those fundings to help them and just to see them, um, you know, uh, change up and just rebuild from the, the bottom up. And it was just so amazing to see how, how it changed from, from day one after until today. Mawar did not, uh, did not hold back from, from hitting whoever it could when it came through our region. But like the title of this show, we are mightier than Mawar and we will continue with more Looking back one year later, keep it here. Instead of a, a long day of action, it was more of a, a late day and an overnight period of action. And it was that long duration. This was a slow moving typhoon as it clipped over the northern parts of Guam. And so we were very fortunate that morning that people that were not in shelter early Wednesday morning, they had that little bit of window to get to shelters at the last minute. But then things rapidly deteriorated Wednesday afternoon and more so into the overnight hours. Do you ever wonder how your favorite products make their way into your local stores? Most arrive on state-of-the-art mats and vessels that transport containers of food, household items, equipment, and supplies into the islands every week. Because we know that you depend on us, we work closely with our partners to ensure that our shipments arrive on time, all the time, so you can find your favorite products when you need them. We transport the region's most precious cargo that supports successful businesses and promotes a better quality of life for our families. Matson is proud to have been the hometown shipping carrier for Guam, the CNMI, and Micronesia for the past 25 years. And you can count on us to be here for generations to come. Jace, Mawar really took down a lot of our, our service capabilities here in the island. All of our networks were trying to get a hold of us. People wanted content. They wanted updates. They couldn't know how to reach us. And we didn't even know if people were watching the news that we were putting together and gathering during and after. But... We did it anyway. Yeah, and uh, telecommunications were so, so essential. And, you know, we were, like you said, we were still doing our job. And we're like, we're going to put this out there. Somebody's going to see it. Everybody's going to share it. Um, but I was literally the next day driving around all over here. I went up to the uh, the Dedito Sports Complex, going around um, the parking lot, finding essentially a sweet spot where I could upload that's night, that night's news that we were putting all putting together, basically editing the whole thing in the back of my car. You know, Daniel and I were doing it with the trunk open, um, just getting stuff out there because everybody wanted to know. And whether you were watching on your phone, on your iPad, if you had, you know, 3% battery left on your, on your mobile device, you know, we were trying to get the word out and we're trying to find a signal wherever we could. Yeah, it was definitely very important to share the stories of how our community was um, facing the aftermath of the typhoon. And one place that we visited was St. Dominic's Senior Care Home, and we learned about the heroics that happened that night, and now their road to recovery. 
In the height of Typhoon Mawar, these heroes without capes hunkered down at the St. Dominic Senior Care Home in Barrigada. It's 17 staff members shelter here with me. We were here for three days straight. Um, no one left, um, just caring for our elders. As Acting Administrator Kate Keesling told us last May, nurses and staff protected the elderly residents as shutters ripped off and windows blew open. I have one staff member who literally blocked her body, used her body to block debris. After a window flew open at one of our patients, um, we're just incredibly lucky no one is hurt or, or passed. Um, we're very lucky to all be alive right now. A year later, they're still on the road to recovery, but a lot has changed. We've had a lot of um, amazing progress in the last year. I mean, last time you guys were here post Typhoon Mawar, we had, you know, ceilings coming down, lights that were out, exposed electrical. Um, furniture that was completely soaked and damaged. They're on demand with donations from the community. The heartbeat of St. Dominic's is really the individuals in the community that, you know, come out and give whatever they can, whenever they can. And the elderly and staff? Our Manamco are great. Um, everyone's doing well. Um, staff, you know, it's hard because they also went through incredible hardship, not only here, but then in their personal lives at home. And um, everyone's great. We had Almost forty forty seven thousand dollars independently donated from off island, which was huge for our staff. While they still have more to do, like replacing their generator, furnitures, and doors, she thanks the community for their support. Thank you so so much for everything. I mean, as individuals, as institutions, we're just so grateful for all the support of St. Dominic's always, and please continue to support the mission. As the winds calmed, the crowds braved going out to see the destruction Mawar left in its wake. The governor had not yet lifted Condition of Readiness 1. Many rushed to find a place that's open for business. At Onodera's store, some lined up early so they could stock up on food and supplies. Carmen Onodera knew she had to work after the storm passed. So you said they were calling you during the storm? Yeah, because, you know, like right after that wind. I'll get messages, you know, because they know me, and if I had it at home, I gave it, mm -hmm. like eggs, you know, coconut milk, yeah. <laughs> bread. And, and even at first light, here you are operating. What's that? Here you are open yeah. and operating at first light. Yeah. Why Why did you decide, I got to do this, even though there's other cleaning up to do? That's because the people, you know, we know they need it. But it's rough, man. I lived all the time. <laughs> Others were out sharing similar experiences. It was really hard. I mean, everything is a mess. Our house, our house is flooded and everything is wet. But I'm thankful that we're still around, you know? Still alive. Yes. In the 12 months that passed, the island still working to get back on its feet. We revisited Onodera's store. How has the year been? Still the same. It's not, we're not fully recovered, you know. I don't, I think we are in some areas, but not all areas. Do the customers still come in and talk about how they're in, still in recovery mode? Yeah. That's tough. You clearly still do what you did that day. Yeah, we still store. do it. Yeah, we still cater to our people. Uh, they, I mean, if that's what you're asking, what do we do? We still cater to our everyday people. Yeah. There's still people that don't have roof over their heads. I mean, you see it. It's out there. You know. That's it? That's it. Oh, wow. Uh, the aftermath, the day after. I think we were still in condition of readiness one, and people were already leaving their homes, trying to pack up on supplies. We visited the owner Dara's store here in Dededo. It was one of the closest places that we could go to. The line wrapped around outside the building, if you can recall that, Suki. Yeah, definitely. And even on our drive um, there to owner Dara's store, it was, um, it was just devastating seeing all the homes that were um, hit hard by the typhoon and all the trees that were down. But once we got to that store, there were people lining up, as you said. They were there to get batteries, to get water, to get ice. Unfortunately, um, a lot of these stores did not have ice. That was one thing that everyone was looking for at the time. Understandably, everyone was very emotional, still shaken about what they went through. One woman I even remember sharing how the, uh, the wind was so strong, she had to take her mattress to hold up against her windows so that the, she wouldn't feel the pressure from what was, she was experiencing in her home. But those that we spoke with at the store that day, they admit that even to this day, we're still recovering. 
we had to lean forward and to make sure that all of the staff were accounted for, but also ready min mentally, physically, and emotionally to engage whatever we're dealing with because what we were doing those days were to save lives. Guam's Auto Appearance Specialist, Elegant Reflections, has been providing the automotive industry with professional detailing and car care products at its highest quality from complete detailing, full interior detailing, exterior detailing, headlamp restoration, hand washing, seat and carpet shampoo, engine degreasing, undercarriage cleaning, paint sealant, fabric protection, paint oxidation removal, and so much more. Visit us at our new location. Call 646-5555 for an appointment. Elegant Reflections, Guam's Auto Appearance Specialist. Over 20 years of experience. The Cantina Chicken Crispy Taco isn't just a late-night taco. It's a seasoned and slow-roasted chicken taco that pairs nicely with the new avocado verde salsa at any time. Introducing the new Cantina Chicken Crispy Taco, only at Taco Bell. The Cantina Chicken Burrito isn't just for late night because it keeps it light with slow-roasted shredded chicken and finely shredded purple cabbage in a freshly grilled tortilla that's not shredded. Introducing the new Cantina Chicken Burrito, only at Taco Bell. Well, you know, one thing that we all kind of share in is the loss of power, water, but for some, they didn't have food, they didn't have a shelter, and that was really hard as a reporter to witness. Um, but thankfully, we got to interview some incredible volunteers with the Red Cross community, the Red Cross organization. So let's take a look at where they are now. They are the guiding hands that helped our island community back on its feet after one of the most impactful natural disasters in recent years from ensuring that people had a hot meal every day. We're delivering 1,100 times two a day for all, and these are all divided to among uh, shelter. We have four shelters open. And also uh, distributing some food for our team. To making sure those who lost everything to Typhoon Mauer had a roof over their heads. Right now it's the assessments with the shelters. Now. Most of the folks don't have a home to go back to. Now a year later, the impact of the collective work by these volunteers with the American Red Cross Guam chapter is still being felt. Almost everywhere we go, I've got people coming up saying, Mr. Dan, remember <laughs> me? You were up at zero there. When we have a conversation, you know, it comes up about Mawar. And, you know, we get so emotional and we like think, oh, how did we do that? Volunteers Dan Kogar and Margie say their experience during Mawar has helped them to fill in the gaps in their natural disaster response. We have our own uh, communication system now, like the Starlink, which we did not have before. We have our own radio, so if that happened again, we would have communication and we could respond immediately, or we could not do that after Mawar. We also have established the um, our vendor, so we already know pretty much who to contact because during Mawar, it's just like everybody's down, so it's hard for us to, to get all this meal ordered. And you know, you're talking about the whole island. Now they say they're ready for whatever comes next. Kogar adding post Mawar, the FEMA warehouse is stocked with the right supplies, streamlining immediate distribution to the community instead of waiting for headquarters to come to the island. From cooking out of their homes to a brick-and-mortar restaurant in the heart of Tumon. It's a success story Habibi's owners Nadao Ware and Sarah Langsley say is all thanks to the community. None of this briefly would have happened without the community support. It was a teamwork. Everyone participated in it. It seemed like the island was in disaster and everyone just jumped in to try to help each other. Yeah. It was last May the former catering business along with friends and volunteers were cooking up a storm after Typhoon Mawar feeding thousands from first responders to families hit the worst. He already knew what to do how he was going to help the island if it got devastated like other places. As a sailor I've spent my life in the ocean. I knew that's not going to miss us. Aware has seen his fair share of natural disasters. He knew he had to prepare for the worst. And I knew that there will not be any commercial kitchen or any place to cook. 
no power. I knew there will not be water. Now their dine-in restaurant has a loyal customer base who remember their actions during the community's time of need. It's and, uh, certainly the right thing work. to do. This was the right thing to do. Simple like that. Yeah. Just want to help whenever we can, wherever we can. That's his motto, and uh, definitely a beautiful motto to adopt and help others. And to this day, Habibi's making sure their cuisine fills the bellies of even those who need it most. So in the aftermath of Typhoon Mawar, I remember just coming back to the station, it being pitch black, you're just having to use our cell phone lights to kind of make our way through the to throughout the station. With the little battery yeah. we had. <laughs> and you know, any you know, it was like hot and that around that time it was really, really hot. So um, it was just how you know, but we just started the recovery, you know, from there, whether it would be just opening the doors to give us some light to just start sweeping out the water, you know, removing stuff that was damaged from the water. Um, but it was really just like all all hands on deck kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and a couple that I had a chance to sit and get their perspective on what they did was Pat Lucis and his beautiful wife, Jenny. Um, they stay like right across the street there from our studio over in Liguan Terrace. And they actually were contacted by almost every single media outlet in the Philippines uh, for their perspective and getting the word out about how things were here and what they could do to help. As leaders in Gov Guam and within the Filipino community, Pat and Jenny Lucis have made their mark locally by looking forward, not back. But the emotional tugs couldn't be avoided by the Dedido couple when they remember that long and frightening evening that Mawar passed over northern Guam. It just brings back all the, all the terror during that time and trying to keep my family safe mm -hmm. and uh, trying to get the word out and trying to make sure my family who are out there are, are safe and um, yeah, it's just Painful, painful times, but uh, I'm, I'm glad we're, we're, we survived. we're in a happy time now. <laughs> we survived. Yeah. The morning after, and despite a loss of power and water, their ability to communicate stayed on as they were contacted by numerous media outlets out of the Philippines for their on-the-ground insight into conditions and where to go for help. Before, during, uh, and, and after Mawar, uh, we were getting calls left and right for interviews. We had over 10 different interviews and at the time they were asking us uh, how our Filipino com uh, community is doing throughout the island and so we were in touch with many of our uh, officers and our members uh, who are living in different parts of the island and we wanted to also uh, do something for, the, for uh, those who were in need, those who were, uh, lost their homes, lost their uh, clothing, uh, food and everything and so uh, we did cut some of our uh, services for, for the island of Guam. Now, as they say, the most insatiable appetite is the hunger for information. And Pat and Jenny provided updates all day long. Uh, you know, it, we had the earliest interview at, uh, I want to say, 8 o'clock in the morning, and it would be like almost uh, every, every hour, every two hours, and they won't stop until 9 o'clock, uh, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, mm -hmm. We have radio stations calling and saying, hey, some things were... We have, we're on one interview, the other one's calling and say, hey, can we get you in? And so uh, it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty hectic. We had to, <laughs> we had to take turns. Uh, hey, you get the 1.30, I'll get the, the 2 o'clock. Jenny had dabbled with social content creation before, but this new opportunity gave her the confidence and experience to develop a new voice, one she continues to use today on YouTube. For, for me to share what our experience was, like, 
this is what happened. This is how it looks right now after the mower the next morning. What, like all the tables out the chairs are like flew away and stuff like that. And what are uh, our neighbors? So it's really like giving information visually. Pat's a longtime public servant, a proud Filipino, and a man of faith. But first and foremost, he's a dad looking after his babies. And Jenny wasn't about clout or trending or influence or boosting her follower count. It was always, for the both of them, about doing the right thing. So the first day actually was all we did after the mawar was all the interviews. We didn't even clean up on everything. We cleaned up after. So it was like, okay, let's take this responsibility. They want to know what happened. Whatever information you want, let's just give it to them. And after a week of post-typhoon cleaning, interviews, and checking on their friends, the Luce's family enjoyed some normalcy, sharing a proper meal together on their porch. With Pat, of course, working the grill and camera operator Jenny chronicling the experience to tell everyone that things were finally all right. Uh, these are the most treasured, treasured memories, treasured moments. Uh, just to have every, all of us together and be a family and just uh, have a meal and share stories. This is what we experienced for three weeks, no power. This is what we did. We're charging our phones in the car. We were sweating. <laughs> and the long gas lines for like the long gas lines. five hours. It was, yeah, it was scary before, but now we're looking, looking back, it, it was, uh, it's like we like, look at it like we survived. What incredible journey this has been with all of you. I think the plus side is it's a much cooler inside <laughs> our studios, right? You can't complain about that, but just so much devastation that we had to endure. I love seeing that island is green again um, and everyone is coming together. For me, the experience is one I do not want to go through, but a clear reminder that we should always stand ready and be prepared for anything that Mother Nature sends our way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess for me too is uh, the same, you know, sharing the same sentiment as you, Nick. You know, uh, it's really, um, you know, for, we've had so much uh, typhoons in the past, but we've always said, we've always had this mindset like, ah, oh, it's just going to pass. It's just one of those that's going to pass. But your so, dog Lambo knew better. Yes, he did. And we had him <laughs> here during the typhoon. Uh, so just seeing this one and just going through it, I, just, I guess for me, it's like preparation is always key um, when, it, knock on the wood, you know, yeah. if another one has to come. So yeah, that's my, just to be prepared and be ready. Well, real quick for me is, is I was fresh out of high school in the early 90s and everything. So I went through that whole string of typhoons for that whole decade period and even, you know, afterwards. But these are things that every Guamanian has to know and will experience. We heard from Landon earlier in the show is, you know, it, this is going to happen again at some point. Um, so these are things that we have to know and be prepared for. And I think like our community is uh, so much better prepared now. I think for me, it's not to take the littlest things for granted. Like afterwards, things that like internet, where we are so we rely on it so much, and just having to make contact with family off island or even news uh, stations abroad mm -hmm. that were wanting to know what happened here, and things such as like a cold drink or ice or a hot meal or whatever. Those things were like so like they were scarce during that time for like two or three weeks, and and it's just things that you. Yeah, you, you just have, when you look at it, it's like you have to kind of appreciate it a little bit more. So. I agree with that. I've never been more grateful to have ice in my freezer than after Typhoon Mawar. I will never complain about the cold aircon again, maybe here and there, but definitely prefer that over the heat. But yeah, next time around, like for God.